G'day and welcome to the program. I'm wondering if you can guess where I am. I'll give you a clue. I'm in a stunning garden, greenery and colour all around me. It's one of the amazing gardens of Open Gardens SA. And more about that later, but first, this is what's on today's program. Callum plays cheesemaker for the day. One down, seven tonnes to go. And whips up the ultimate cheese toasty. And the tale of a beehive kiln that helped build a suburb. But first, here's Hazy. I've got a little poem for you. Headlights are red, dirt is brown. Helmets on, accelerate it down. OK, so it's no Banjo Patterson. But to witness Team Izuzu D-Max perform is truly poetry in motion. You may have caught them recently at the Royal Adelaide Show. They're the longest running precision driving team in the country. For over 50 years, they've been wowing the crowds around Australia at city and regional shows. G'day, Jack. Hey, how you going, mate? Good, thanks, mate. I've got to tell you, this is probably one of the most unique jobs I've ever seen. How on earth do you get into something like this? Uh, all the guys have a, have a motorsport background, predominantly rally driving, so yeah, we love driving cars at crazy speeds in the forest, so that's your resume as such, and once you've got the, the driving techniques mastered, then you come and learn the routine. Jack, I've never been on two wheels before, i have got to be honest with you, so uh, I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, I've got full faith in you. It's a pretty exciting experience, let's go do it. All right, let's do it. First up, Jack's going to show me what this car is made of. All he needs is a ramp. Oh, and a bucket load of skill. All right, good to go? Good to go. I mean, why drive on four wheels when just two will do? Here we go. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. How's that up there, all right? This does not. This doesn't feel natural. It's hard coming from a rally background. This is the last thing you want to have a car at the angle. <laughs> Jump up. <laughs> I've actually never been in the passenger seat before. Oh, really? Do you, want me, to, do you want me to show you that uh, stuff? Yeah, sure. You got your car out in the car park? No, you're an old Calais. Eh? That would disintegrate if I tried this. We're going to put it down. We've finished our full lap. Here we go. You ready? Yep. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that is unbelievable. Glad you enjoyed it. That is cool. Do you get used to that? No. No. <laughs> but Jack's not done with me yet. Next, a four-way crossover with the team. Oh, that is close. Needless to say, timing is everything. Ready to go way past this time. Here we go. Oh, jeez. Okay, that was that. Mate, I almost want to close my eyes. That would be a terrible idea if you decided to do that. Happy days. That is cool. Thank goodness that's over. I don't think I have the nerves for this kind of thing. Oh, that is unbelievable. Jack, jeez, mate, that was a serious hit of adrenaline. Oh, the two-wheeling thing is something that I'll never mentally be like, that's normal, because a rally driver, you never want to have a car like that. It's the first thing is to get it back on the ground. Oh, well, thank you very much, mate. No I worries, appreciate that, time. and uh, safe and sound. <laughs> well, after that experience, it's time to take some deep breaths and regroup. So, I couldn't resist taking a closer look at Team Izuzu D-Max's latest creation, Concept X. To give you an idea of just how big this beast is, I'm around six foot two on a good day. This completely towers over me. It's incredible. No siree, this ain't no ordinary vehicle. I reckon it looks more like a transformer. You can see these incredible cars at the Adelaide Four Wheel Drive and Adventure Show. We can also jump in the passenger seat yourself for a two wheel ride or challenge your nerves on their Iron Summit, the world's steepest four-wheel drive ramp. It's sure to make your eyes water. People of Adelaide love to get involved. You know, we have some of the biggest passenger ride numbers come through our vehicles at the Adelaide shows. I expect over three days, we'll have around about 1,500 people go for a ride on two wheels. Make sure you get yourself down to the Adelaide Four Wheel Drive and Adventure Show next weekend. And why not take the opportunity to jump in the passenger seat with the fellas? Trust me, it's the most fun you'll have on wheels. Coming up, an inspirational hills garden bursting with colour. 
you obsessive, aren't you? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a gardener. <laughs> Well, spring has certainly sprung, especially here at Ashgrove Iris Gardens at Gummaraka, where I'm among 900 different varieties, or maybe even a thousand different varieties of these glorious iris. But that's only the beginning of the story. Actually, I'm just talking about the tall bearded iris alone. That doesn't even include all the dwarf, Siberian, and Dutch varieties here too. The gardener with an iris addiction is Di Milkak, but her passion is a healthy one with glorious results. Di, tell me about the beginnings of Ashgrove Iris Gardens. How did it all start? A friend of mine, when I was about 22, took me down to see a garden at Millswood. A gentleman by the name of Gilbert Cole had this fabulous iris garden. I'd never seen anything like it. I bought six plants from him and I've been buying them ever since. With pathways winding through garden beds, you can meander through this riot of colour at leisure. And the name tags make for fun reading as you go. That's called Enter the Dragon. It's beautiful. And then you go for something like this, yeah. which is quite an unusual colour. They're just really quite amazing. Mm. Even though irises look dainty and delicate, it's actually a surprisingly resilient and water-wise plant. And Di reckons anyone can grow them. These are the ones that most people could grow in their own garden, couldn't they? Oh, they're very, very hardy. This is just a common old everyday garden soil. It's not had any special treatment, just a general garden loam. I throw a bit of general fertiliser around. I gave them a really good dose of potash last year and it's paid off this year. Do you still buy plants? All the time. You're obsessive, aren't you? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a gardener. That's what gardeners do. And for the times when they aren't in flower, this garden has been cleverly designed to look lovely all year round. You've got a nice balance. I mean, when the iris are down and resting, you've got other plants oh, yes. dotted around, which yes. are pretty strategic. You've got lovely roses, of course. Yes, I love David Austin roses. Uh, the roses tend to come into flower as the tall bearded irises are just finishing up. And of course, the roses will re-bloom again, whereas the irises, some do, but generally the main flowering is in spring. So you've got dotted through here a whole raft of different plants yes. under these beautiful upright birch die, eh? I love the bark on these trees. Oh, they, so... they age beautifully. Yeah. All mm. the irises through mm. here are in shades of cream and yellow to match the bark on the birch. Other interesting features you'll find include fountains and a water tank painted by a local artist to reflect the different seasons. And if that's not enough, there's one more crowd pleaser. I've heard that one of the big attractions are your scones. I have some people who come to my garden Just every year and they come for the serious? scones. It's my mother's recipe, it's an old recipe and it just makes really good scones. You can visit the Ashgrove Iris Garden in all its glory on the 27th and 28th of October. Head to the Open Gardens SA website for more details and to find out what else is on their calendar. Get out there and get inspired, and maybe even grab a scone. After the break, the building of a suburb brick by brick. As a city, we've grown over more than 180 years, street by street, suburb by suburb, and brick by brick. Now part of that amazing story is available to us all here at Beverley in Adelaide's western suburbs, where the old beehive brick kiln stands as a monument to another time. It's the only one left in South Australia. It's effectively circular, and as you can see, it's got a domed roof, and you can see the heat and temperature that's been built up in here because the brick surface is actually glazed. So they've melted? Correct. Here at Two Good Avenue, the Charles Sturt Council spent half a million dollars preserving what remains of Adelaide's brickmaking heritage. It's important because it represents a significant part of the history of the western suburbs, a history that actually spanned more than 100 years. And it's a significant place where people were employed and where community was developed and thrived. In the beehive kiln, they fired more ornate products, like glazed bricks featured in verandas like this one at Colonel Light Gardens. 
thousands of bricks were needed for a new suburb like this, built as part of the state government sponsored Thousand Homes Scheme. After the First World War, there was a serious housing shortage in Adelaide with returned servicemen coming back and establishing their families. And so the government was looking to supply that housing need for returned servicemen and really the working class. So much of what we take for granted in the older parts of suburban Adelaide came from this heritage precinct. This is a, a phenomenal sort of archaeological site in its own way, isn't it? It is, yeah, absolutely correct. It is the only example left in Adelaide of effectively a working brick site, considering that Adelaide, particularly the western suburbs, was a focus of brick making. Heritage architect Andrew Clenkey would love to get his hands on some of the more ornate specially shaped bricks and earthenware pipes and fittings made at the many brickworks that dotted this site. In fact, the enormous green space near the Beverly Kilns covers just one of the many old pug holes where clay was sourced to make the bricks that made much of Adelaide. In the early days of the colony, pug holes and brick kilns dotted much of the River Torrens. But as the brickmakers exhausted supplies of local clay, the brick kilns moved further into the western suburbs. In fact, the James family moved from the Torrens Riverbank to this site in the 1920s. And the reason says so much about just how unsafe this early industry could be. It was dangerous and dirty work. These brick kilns were fired up to 1,000 degrees. And occasionally, when the banks of the Torrens burst and floodwaters seeped into furnaces, it would create a terrifying cocktail. In 1923, the brickworks were actually flooded there and they were firing a kiln at the time. And the inrush of water that actually um, entered into the kiln was converted into steam and the expansion actually blew the whole structure up. And there's a report of bricks being thrown, you know, up to 100 yards away. Thankfully, they're in a much more confined space these days. The James family brick kilns are located on Too Good Avenue at Beverly. Next, Callum makes the ultimate cheese toasty. When it comes to cheese making, SA bats well above its average, and it's no coincidence. Like most crafts, it's only as good as the product that goes into it, and in this case, it's some of the best anywhere in the world. Yes, we're lucky to have some remarkable farmers and producers doing some amazing things with dairy. Just come in. And today, I've followed my nose to Section 28 in Woodside to see if I can lend a hand. This is the production room. On any given day, cheesemaker Kim Masters and his team are busy working their magic, transforming 500 litres of fresh raw milk into 55 kilos of amazing cheese. We're in the middle of making a fontina, so raw milk fontina, which is uh, based on the cheese of Valdosta. And uh, at the moment we're mixing and heating it up. It's uh, semi-hard, so we try and get as much water out as we can. These guys specialise in alpine cheeses, which has less to do with the altitude it's produced at and more to do with the style. Traditionally, it's a large format cheese with a hard rind, like the ones made in the European Alps. How important is milk in your process? Uh, fundamental. I tend to say that in here, 30% of the work is done before we actually get it, which means 30% of the work is done by the dairy farmer. Kim sources his milk from just up the road, from dairy farmers Andrew and Sonia Maxwell. Their happy Holstein heifers produce milk that's just right for cheesemaking. They've been awarded for their quality, so that's really a big part of it for us. When the temperature is just right and the curds are small enough, the whey is drained and hand poured into each mould. Now, it might not look that heavy, but this jug would must weigh five or six kilos, yeah, surely. Kilos, and yeah. doing that repeatedly, it actually it gets pretty heavy. You can see why Kim's got massive guns. <laughs> Once it's all scooped out into the hoops, it's into the press before being brined and finally put on the shelf to age. So how long do we wait for the pressing? Uh, this, this will press overnight, but it's 120 days before you can actually eat one of these. OK, I'll get my watch <laughs> yeah, going. <laughs> now that the Fontina is on its way, it's time to clean everything down and start again. It's an intensive process, all done by hand. This warm, human environment is perfect for cheese making. Yeah, not so good for TV cameras. And their magic cave isn't much better either. There's seven tonnes of cheese housed in this climate-controlled room with humidity at 
Mate, this looks like my idea of heaven. Tell me about where we are. So this is our ageing room, this is our cave. All of our cheeses are in here and we age them between 40 days and 12 months. Along with the Fontina, there's four other core cheeses in the Section 28 range. The Monforte, the Il Lupo, which is a raclette style washed in local Lobo apple cider, the Mont Priscilla with its distinctive ash line, and the semi-soft and a little bit funky Mont Rouge, which has inspired me to get cooking. Now, when it comes to cheese for me, nine times out of 10, I don't want to do anything to it at all. I just want to sit there, have a little piece of cheese, a little glass of wine, and I'm a very happy camper. But on the rare occasion that I do cook it, you've got to do it properly. And for me, that means the perfect toasted cheese sandwich. So we've got some of Kim's Mont Rouge here. Uh, we've got a little bit of Metwurst. We've got a zucchini pickle that we're going to make as well. So really super simple. Okay, so the first ingredient we're going to put in is the sugar. So three parts vinegar to one part sugar. So say three quarters of a cup of vinegar, a quarter of a cup of caster sugar. The next one we're going to go in is with some turmeric, lovely earthy kind of flavor. And of course that bright yellow color too. Follow on that with some mustard seeds, two teaspoons or so worth. And then a couple of bay leaves as well. Just give them a slight scrunch and chuck them in too. Just want to dissolve that sugar a little bit in the warm vinegar. Pour this on top of our nice shaved zucchini. And we just wait for three to four hours or ideally overnight until it takes on the flavor of that pickling liquid. Okay, so due to the magic of television, our zucchinis have beautifully pickled and we can start assembling our toasty now. So a big thick slab of the cheese. Remember this is the ultimate cheese toasty can go on. Um, some Metwurst next. So this is kind of a nostalgic thing for me because my papa used to work at Linky's Butcher uh, in Uri for many years. Do a big old kind of pinch of our zucchini pickle here as well. Pop that into the toasty machine. And now we just need to wait. Won't be long, girls. Well, there you have it. My ultimate cheese toasty. And I have to tell you, it smells pretty good. You can find Section 28 cheese at Foodland, the Smelly Cheese Shop, as well as in white tablecloth restaurants all around the state. And if you fancy an out of this world cheese toasty or any other cheesy delight for that matter, then make sure you head along to Cheese Fest and Ferment the Festival. It's on next weekend in Rymel Park. Fellow cheese lovers, I'll be there with my sprout stall, so make sure you come say good day. I'll see you there. Life is really busy and sometimes we don't get a chance to smell the roses or admire the iris. And we really should. And you can do that by getting along to see some of the stunning gardens that are part of Open Gardens SA. I'll guarantee you it'll do you the world of good. Now here's what's coming up on next week's program. Ron heads off piste in beautiful McLaren Vale. And we take off on a caravanning adventure. We look forward to your company next week.